with no further ado, let me hand the forum over to Christopher Haynes, director of the Learning Experience Design Group within the Provost Office of Academic Innovation. Chris, thank you for joining us today. Well, thank you so much, William, and, and thanks to everyone who was able to carve out some time uh, on what I'm sure is, is a, a busy week among many busy weeks this summer to have these kinds of conversations. And William, let it never be said that you uh, don't give an amazing introduction that is always hard to follow. <laughs> but I appreciate that. And I appreciate the opportunity to come talk with you guys. Um, I've had just a, a tremendous experience working uh, more closely inside and with the College of Engineering and Applied Science faculty and some of the departments there over the last few years. Um, and having been a graduate student on the other side of campus, it's really refreshing to see how many how many different people and diverse people across campus care about teaching and what we can learn from one another. So I'm very excited. So let me very quickly uh, make sure that I can present and share my screen and that you guys can see everything. So can you still hear me and can you see my screen? Okay, good, I'm seeing some nods, that's great. So um, the, the perhaps, um, you know, plain, title of this brief presentation is alternatives to video that also reach students but there's a lot of good ideas underneath that that we'll that we'll dig into um, my email's up here on the screen and uh, as william said i love talking about this kind of stuff and i'm more than happy to follow up on any questions you guys might have after this talk continue these kinds of topics um, in whatever venue makes sense so i'm excited to to get started so um, I want to start today with just a couple of quick premises that have grounded a lot of my experience in thinking about higher education, teaching and learning and pedagogy. The first of those premises is that university teaching is fundamentally idiosyncratic. It resists standardization and homogenization and other uh, attempts to corral it. There's no real universal solution in any context for all teachers, all courses, all learners, or all kinds of content. And that's one of the great things about university teaching. It's one of the challenges, but it's one of the great things. The second premise is that we are all or most of us familiar with the physical classroom. And that familiarity has, has yielded a kind of normalization and an internalization of the constraints of that space. I think we sort of know what a classroom is, and so we don't think about what it either pushes us to do or prevents us from doing. We are conversely pretty unfamiliar with the environments of online teaching and learning. And so often when we approach those environments with which we're not as familiar, their constraints are right in the foreground. They're right in front of us. They appear all consuming. They appear all encompassing. They appear completely insurmountable. But underneath both of those environments, there is still us. There, there is still you as a teacher, as an educator. There are still your students as people ready to learn. And so unpacking some of those constraints and our relative access to them is one of the kind of foundational approaches I've taken to the work of learning design. So these two premises, lots more to say about that, but I want to leave them here hanging for us to think about with one sort of reinforcement. I think both of these premises lead me to believe that higher education, especially higher education in 2020 and in the next few years, requires both a responsive and a resilient pedagogy. And so we have to be ready to sort of follow this call and be in this moment, which will challenge us in ways that perhaps um, our teaching and learning practices have not challenged us before. So we're in an environment where all of our known patterns, environments, structures, or at least many of them are actively being disrupted. And I don't mean disrupted in the sense of like 2012 MOOCs disrupting things. I mean like literally everything you thought you were preparing for for fall is now changed because of the circumstances we find ourselves in. So I think this is an opportunity for us to reframe the relationships we draw between our teaching presence, the presence of our content, and our students as learning presences in the environments of our classrooms. For some people, this moment will be sort of a temporary change of circumstances 
and things will return to quote unquote normal at some point in the future. I think for other people, this is an opportunity for a fundamental evolution of the foundations of our practice, right? It, it shakes everything that we do and opens our eyes to new pathways of doing those things. Regardless of where you fall on this kind of spectrum, if we can call it that, I think this is an opportunity for all of us to make a better and a more inclusive higher education working together. I mean, we were talking in the brief pre-workshop chatter about the, the need to kind of bring together all of the various tendrils of the conversations about teaching that are happening on a campus like this. We have an unprecedented opportunity right now to do that work and to make that work consistent and lasting. And it's really kind of a wonderful opportunity. So we're, we're here today after that sort of brief introduction to talk about video. And I'll include in this kind of the loose categories of pre-recorded video artifacts and synchronous video, um, a la what we're doing right now. And we can talk a little bit about the valences of what I'm gonna discuss a little bit later in both of those buckets. But we're talking about video in general and its alternatives. There are no shortage of opportunities and choices and ways that we can facilitate learning experiences, that we can present content to our students, and that we can invite our students to engage with one another and with that content. And this is especially so in online, remote, and the kind of hybridized environments we're going to find ourselves in in the next couple of years. So as a kind of precondition, I want to lay out a thesis for our discussion today, which is that in all things, the needs of the content itself should drive the mode of its delivery, not the other way around. And I think that kind of inversion, right, thinking about the specific needs of the content and the learning environment, rather than what things we're going to put into that learning environment, really gets to one of the fundamental principles of learning design. And that is that desired student outcomes and goals for a course should drive all of the assessments and experiences and things and activities you have students doing in that course, what students need to be able to engage with those assessments and experiences and activities should drive the choice of content selection and what content is presented for the course. And then all the way at the end of this chain, after all of those considerations have been, have been taken, we wanna think about how best to present that necessary content and assessment and experience. So some of you will probably have heard terms like backwards design. Um, this is a, an, one expression of a kind of backwards design model. But really what it is, is inviting us as educators to privilege the experiences we want our students to have over the coverage of content we think is necessary. And this isn't to say that we need to ignore content or conversely, we need to ignore assessment and experience. They need to work as an ecosystem. And we need to think about how those components fit together to best facilitate the circumstances of the learning environment our students find themselves in. So um, in the moment we're in right now, I'm sure you guys have seen a lot of things. There are workshop series. There are articles being published in the Chronicle and, and Inside Higher Ed every single day on best practices and recommendations. There are all kinds of just sort of lists being produced of ways to do this sort of stuff. Um, and I think that those lists can be really valuable in framing and provoking and, you know, sort of instigating thought. Um, but none of them should be read as deterministic rules. Video is one way, both recorded and live video, is one option to present content among many options. And as an educator, remember university teaching is idiosyncratic, you are empowered to make choices that best fit the needs of your learning environment. You know, William, in your introduction, you talked about how this sort of workshop series is an example of teachers enabling learners. And I really like that framing of enabling because t university teaching isn't monodirectional, right? It's, it's, a, a, it's a process of give and take and feedback and return and um, part of the choices we make about our content and how we structure our courses 
um, impacts how that kind of feedback loop works. So we're gonna talk about some of the ways that video fits into that and maybe some of the ways we can think beyond video as we continue. So um, let's talk about some affordances of video. And I should note actually before I talk about the affordances that just like there can be a really good lecture and a kind of a crummy poor lecture on any given day, just like there can be a really great seminar discussion and a really dead seminar discussion, likewise with labs, with recitations, all of it, right? There's good and bad independent of the modal modality of delivery. Video and non-video fall into that same rubric, right? There can be really engaging, really wonderful video. There can be really dull, really flat video. So the presence of the, of the mode isn't deterministic of the efficacy of the content, if that makes sense. But there are some affordances to video. Video can be a really effective tool. One is that video can be engaging and humanizing. It really can allow students to see you and feel a kind of connection to you as an educator. And in this kind of environment where we're in a synchronous video conferencing mode, um, it allows me to see you and to start to develop a, a relationship with you. And that can be a really powerful part of a learning experience. Video also can be enhanced and expanded and extended with interactivity kinds of components. So you can use tools like PlayPosit, right, to include in-video questions, polling, all those kinds of things, um, and tools like VoiceThread to allow um, your, learning, your learning environment community to talk amongst one another about video, that sort of thing. So video can be enhanced and extended in a number of ways. And it's worth noting, and you know, I don't wanna overstate this, but I think it's important that video can look really, really good. And it can add a level of flash and professionalism and kind of performance to your content that has legitimate impact on a lot of learners. I mean, the, the kind of presentation of you through video can be a conduit for charisma that connects you with your learners and your learners with you. So all of these things, this is certainly not an exhaustive list, but all of these things are ways in which video can be really effective and can work really well. So let's talk about the other side. Let's talk about liabilities of video. And again, not a comprehensive list or an exhaustive list, but some things to think about. Video is very costly to produce, even with things like, you know, recording this Zoom session and then exporting it and uploading it to a Canvas course. Um, costly from that standpoint is costly on a student's bandwidth and watching the video and the LMS later, right? But video can be costly with respect to the equipment it takes to produce it. The, environmental variables of whatever your, your recording environment is. If you want something a little flashier than like, like my home office with like a partially pulled over curtain, right? Setting up your environment to record video can be a costly endeavor. And certainly video is costly of your time. Video takes a lot of time to produce, even with seasoned educators who have lectured the same lecture for 20 years, when you get in front of a camera, it's gonna take you 10 takes. And that is a, a huge time cost. As an educator whose time is very valuable, um, that's one of the things that needs to be weighed. Second point I wanna make uh, as a liability of video is that video is, is more difficult perhaps than some other content types to be made accessible and inclusive of all learners. And this is especially true in some of the fields that, that you all are a part of, which would in, uh, include a lot of technical material that would require a lot more complicated captioning and visual description of diagrams and other elements. Bringing video of this type into the level of accessibility and inclusivity that helps all learners access it and, and participate in it and consume it is a costly endeavor both of time and of, uh, at times, university resources, although there are a lot of um, groups in play on campus that can support faculty in this work. But it's an important consideration that that's one of the costs of choosing video as a delivery method. And the last sort of liability I wanna call out right now about video is that it is a generally fixed and unresponsive mode. So when you encode information as a video artifact, and upload it to your, to your course shell, you're essentially rendering that content static with the caveat that you could you know, put sort of a voice thread around it and maybe make some corrections, but it is in general a static artifact. So anytime information needs to change, 
it either needs to be re-recorded, patched in, or otherwise augmented. So especially for the areas of your curriculum that might be more dynamic or responsive to new developments in industry, new research in the field, those kinds of things, video becomes a, a kind of baggage that needs to be updated and re-rendered and re-recorded on an ongoing basis. And that can be an additional cost on time and resources, your own time and resources. I think calling out these affordances, calling out some of these liabilities, my aim is not to convince you one way or the other. My aim is to illuminate some of the dynamics that a, that a choice about content presentation can trigger. So one thing I want to leave you with here after we, since we've talked about affordances and liabilities is that video works best, in my opinion, when it's you and not your content that's delivering value to students. And what I mean by this is your content can be delivered in a lot of different ways, can be presented to students or represented for students in a lot of different ways, but it's harder to capture you. And so when your unique contribution, like your particular interpretation of a topic or area, your research background that informs that topic or area, your current research agenda that drives that topic or area, when it's you and not the content that you're delivering that is valuable, video can be a very effective tool. And that thinking about the full scope of options you have available to you for content presentation allows you, it opens up a space for you to be precise about when and how a content mode like video can be most valuable and most efficacious. And it will allow you to free up some of that time that you might have spent recording a whole bunch of videos doing something else so you can spend more time on the videos you want to produce. So that's sort of my overall point in this framework of affordances and liabilities is that you want to open up a space where you can make the right choice for the right tool, for the right content, for the right delivery modality, so that you're maximizing both your ability to author and your students' ability to access and learn. So where does this yield us? Some alternatives to video, <laughs> which is actually the purpose of the, of the talk, right? 20 minutes in. Um, this is, again, not a comprehensive list. This is a list that's intended to prompt some of your thinking and instigate some exploration. But I want to lay out just a handful of things that can be used to kind of acknowledge that, um, that sense of affordance and liability of video. First, fairly straightforward. You probably have a lot of content already generated in non-video format from your previous teaching. You probably have slides with content on them. You've got lecture notes. You've got other sort of peripheral material that you've used to engage your students in class prior to this sort of moment. Those assets can be leveraged as static documents or you know, dynamic documents, depending on how, how much you want students to be moving around in them, but they can be rendered not as video, but as reading items inside a course. You, know, you can present your lecture slides as images and present your lecture notes as the narrative that brings those pieces of content together so that you can have the raw content generation occur in a place that's much easier to edit, that doesn't require bandwidth to access, that can be much more um, quickly and easily brought to, the, brought to fore, brought to the students, um, and free up more time for introducing a particular angle or approach or a framework to that content with a video. Second, and somewhat related, there's just a, an enormous amount of educational material out there right now, some of which is really great, some of which is really poor, and with a whole lot of middle ground in between. And practicing a kind of pedagogy of curation can help you pull together existing content that makes sense within your curriculum or within the needs of your course, um, which could then offset some of your need to produce that content again. Now, obviously, there's some limitations with this, right? When you have a particular interpretive angle or when the existing materials don't meet your needs, there are some constraints. But starting that work of thinking about where the high quality and high value educational material that's out there lives uh, can be really effective. 
Likewise, kind of related to this in the third point, open educational resources, you know, uh, resources that are openly licensed, especially when you can include students in the process of finding them, validating them, contextualizing them within a scholarly field can be a very effective tool that, again, helps offset some of your need to generate content. And that, that point about students helping vet, I think, is really important because, you know, one of the challenges that a lot of faculty and educators face when it comes to OER is the, the sort of mountain of stuff that needs to be evaluated and vetted in order to, to validate whether or not um, it makes sense and fits inside a course. But part of that work is, you know, building a sense of awareness of a scholarly field or a disciplinary domain. It's building a sense of evaluating a set of digital tools and their potential applications. And those are really good digital literacy skills and academic literacy skills to help our students engage in or to help engage our students in. Um, so the work, that work of curation, that work of pulling together existing material can be part of the learning experience itself, not just a way to inject additional content into a course. Um, after that, the fourth bullet here, interactive simulations like what we have right here hosted on our own campus, FET, um, and things like Carnegie Mellon University's open learning initiatives or Wolfram Alfred's online platform. All of these things are conduits for getting students to engage in a particular set of experiences or content areas that go beyond um, a particular video of you or of your content and that can augment that sense of the curricular dynamic in your course. These are all things that can be pulled together to create and communicate the richness of your area, of your scholarly domain, um, for your students. And the last bullet point I've put up here is thinking broadly about student-generated content. So kind of like thinking about students helping vet open educational resources, thinking about your students as, and, and your course community as a content generation avenue in and of itself, right? You're not the only entity in your learning environment that can generate content. Students could present on particular topics or um, have regular discussions about their own emerging research agendas, you know, what they're doing in labs, how they're finding connections across courses, those kinds of things that can help kind of stitch together the areas of your curriculum with student generated content that renders it, you know, meaningful for them and a good learning experience for them to, to know how to produce those kinds of either digital artifacts or documents or even videos themselves. So again, these are not, and this is not an exhaustive list of alternatives to video. The primary point here is that video is one component in a larger ecosystem that can include content you generate, content your students can generate, or content others have generated um, that exists out in our scholarly worlds. And all of that is an opportunity for you to, to pull the relevant pieces together and create something that's really meaningful and engaging for you and for your students. So this leads me to um, a handful of recommendations that I want to leave us with to kind of prompt the discussion portion of this workshop. The first, and this will seem like I'm beating a dead horse at this point, but my recommendation is to use video intentionally and not automatically. Use it when and where it adds value and think carefully about where and when you think it will add value so that it can be used most effectively. Second, consider what generally you're asking your students to do in your courses. Are you asking them to sit and watch videos or are you asking them to get up and do something with the material that they're engaged with or, or engaging in? And in general, you know, we, we know sort of terms in the atmosphere, student-centered learning, active learning, those kinds of things, high impact practices. All of those kind of educational buzzwords are getting at the core principle of wanting to get students to do something and not just watch something. So that's something to keep in mind as you make choices about the kinds of content and how you're engaging students in that content. And then lastly, this is more of a general pedagogical principle, but I feel it's important to slip it in every chance I can get. Um, regardless of what kind of content you choose or how you choose to present it, 
be mindful always of trying to build in feedback loops that facilitate metacognition and self-reflection on the part of students. No matter the modality, engaging students in inviting them to think about what choices you've made, why you've made them, and how your students might be able to variously engage with those choices will reinforce and, and, and help scaffold the learning that you're wanting them to engage in in the core content of the course. So that kind of feedback, metacognition, self-reflection layer, maybe layer is not the right metaphor. It's kind of like a bubble that goes all around your entire course so that everything is filtered through that process of, uh, of reflection so that students are never left wondering why you had them engage in a particular thing or why you had them do a particular thing based on their engagement with your content. So those recommendations are, are I hope, provocations for us to talk through some of these implications. Um, I did wanna call out the fact that if you're interested in more discussions of this type, one of the resources that has been set up by a kind of consortium of campus units uh, in, in this time of coronavirus, as my son is often saying, um, is a Microsoft team called the Online Instructor Roundtable. This was a group originated with the Learning Design Group in Continuing Education, and they've very graciously expanded its parameters out to serve the broader campus community. So if you're interested in, in having some conversations like this, sharing some resources and sharing some of your experiences, this link here displayed will get you um, into that group. And if you're not able to copy down the link or you can't find it afterwards, feel free to reach out to me directly and I can facilitate you joining. So that's really what I wanted to, to present with us today. I hope that we can have a, a stimulating discussion. Uh, I'm sure you guys have some questions and I look forward to talking about them. Chris, that was wonderful. Thank you. Um, yes, the, the distance format uh, mutes somewhat the enthusiasm, but let me just say that was wonderful. I have to say, I am always startled at uh, how conceptually rich your presentations are. I gave you a real kind of flat topic, al alternatives to video, text. <laughs> and I think you've made it into something really, really conceptually rich worth exploring. And I think that the three ideas I've drawn out, and I'll pipe down in a moment, are this idea of University teaching is idiosyncratic. I think that's so important at a time where standardization seems to be what we're searching out. And yet, how we maintain the idiosyncratic nature of the university classroom, that nature that leads into passion and motivation on the part of each student, identification, passion, and motivation. So that's great. The notion of constraint and that our normal classroom is naturalized to us. We see no constraint walking into a lecture hall, but in fact, there are many constraints. And that, I, I've always enjoyed how you turn that on its head and, and try and seek out ways in which the online environment has constraints, but those constraints are only equivalent to the constraints of the lecture hall. Now you've introduced this notion of an ecosystem and what you referred to at the end as a metacognitive bubble that exists around the classroom. That I'm going to have to think about for a while. And um, maybe while I think about that, we can open up the conversation for general discussion because I'm sure that people have things to say. So um, I turn it over to the mosaic of faces before me. Guys, please slow down. I can't, I can't take down notes fast enough. I know, I know. Don't make me come down there. Don't make me come down there and call on y'all. I, I have a thought to share. What would it look like if we had no videos? Have you ever done that before? Yeah, the, the vast majority of the time in which courses have been offered at a distance or online happened without video. And that's because this is, the, I mean, this work has been happening, well, 
University of London is always proud to uh, announce they, that, that Queen Victoria began distance learning at the University of London. Um, but certainly there's been a long history, even in the second half of the 20th century, where learning in a remote way occurred outside of digitally reproduced video artifacts. So I think there's lots of ways where we can, where we can present our learning experiences that are not reliant on a particular modality. Um, now that produces new challenges or, or it had introduced some challenges, right? I mean, it's much more difficult to, um, for a student to know who you are as an instructor or, you know, how your body language communicates your engagement with the, with the content, that kind of stuff outside of video, that becomes a challenge. But I, I don't see, I don't see a world where video is necessary, even the world we're in now, where video is necessary to meet core learning outcomes. I mean, unless it's a, you know, of course, like media production or something like that, where the content necessitated that. Um, I think it's one choice among many choices, as I said, that has uh, inhabited a kind of privileged position, um, partly as, as in as a result of the legacy of MOOCs, the existing, I should say legacy of MOOCs, sounds like they're not here anymore, but the lineage of MOOCs. Um, and I'm not sure that that's a good part of that lineage, although that's a debatable point. But I don't see anything that is necessary, as in a requirement about video. I see it as one tool. Can, can you speak again about the difference between, for example, you, you mentioned that uh, you could use slides or lecture notes as an alternative um, to video, but, but ultimately they, they will become video, right? Uh, or am I understanding this wrong? Uh, because I, I guess I, I didn't grasp the difference between a video and just using my slides where I'm walking through the slides, but I'm capturing it in video again. So I hope yeah, my, my question is clear. <laughs> no, it's a great question. I appreciate the opportunity to clarify. Yeah, I, I am thinking about this as a separate thing from, say, the <clears throat> process of doing a screen recording where you are narrating your engagement with the slide material. So, you know, what I'm envisioning here, and one thing that I've done, not necessarily with PowerPoint slides, but with other kinds of graphics and visual elements in my own teaching, is essentially create a page in Canvas that has, you know, some headers and it's got an intro and it's got some text and it's got my interpretations and the prompting questions that I'm asking students, all that kind of stuff, interspersed with things like screenshots from a tool that we're talking about or, you know, a snippet of a music video that we're talking about because I do a class in pop culture. Um, kind of bringing together text and image and video elements, curated video elements, into a single frame for a student to engage in. And then I typically will end with, you know, uh, some prompting questions that we then follow up on in discussion. So if you were to use that kind of approach for something like a, a fairly fundamental, you know, kind of content-based PowerPoint slide deck, you could just extract your slides as images, place them, contextualize them, you know, in sequence. And this could get tricky if you guys get fancy with your PowerPoint slides and you've got, you know, like swoops and transitions and dynamics, stuff like that. It, you know, this kind of flattens some of those elements, but it gives students a kind of static thing that they can refer back to asynchronously that they don't have to scroll around through and that they can, um, you know, access more easily in a variety of different, you know, Wi-Fi and bandwidth and internet scenarios. So that's kind of what I was referring to is, you know, taking the idea of a sequence of slides that you talk through as lecture and disaggregating those into a kind of text and image based reading experience. So given that, why is that more powerful? Or what are the powers of that as opposed to um, a video of me voiceovering my PowerPoint? Why do you choose in your own course, let's imagine a PDF that has a running prose narrative of points I wanna make about the PDF slides. Why do I wanna choose that as a variant within my course, Chris. Uh, 
I think there's there's a few different ways to approach that, that question. One is is purely kind of mercenary, right? It is um, simpler and more scalable to produce a resource like that and edit it and modify it each term and you know update it with new information than it is to produce a video artifact that then needs to be re-recorded or re-narrated every time. Um, I also think, you know, and this is partially my own approach, but you know, it's it's my use case. I tend to very richly hyperlink these kinds of experiences for students so that they're seeing the sources of material that I'm drawing from. They're seeing, you know, extensions of that material into other published resources. You know, there's lots of kind of interlinking that happens for me. And part of the reason why I do that is to help students cultivate the kind of digital literacy that comes with navigating and synthesizing information from a variety of different sources and modalities. So for me, the, the right fit choice for that kind of content is a more kind of interactive document because it allows it to be kind of a living and breathing document that can evolve very rapidly and responsively to student inputs, to my inputs, that kind of stuff. Um, for me, I, <clears throat> I, as a learner, process information more effectively when I have a chance to kind of rapidly reread it and review it, as opposed to kind of clicking back and forth across a video. And my attention tends to be held more effectively when um, I'm engaging in content of that type. And now I don't make that claim for all learners, right? Lots of different people process information and retain that information in different ways. But um, one of the things that I learned as I, as I was developing my own courses from students was that students were responding well to this format and they were pulling out and responding in discussions to the questions that I included in these documents more regularly than they were doing with the questions that I narrated and like the kind of Prezi presentations that I spent hours and hours meticulously presenting. So for me, it became a, a kind of obvious choice to reduce the costliness, the, the time cost for me to get better impact on the students that were engaged in my course. But again, like I said, there's no, there's no rule or no one size fits all solution here. So that was responsive to the specific you know, variables in my learning environment, in my course. And part of what I think was gained in that process was that I learned to be conscious of that and ask questions about it and be mindful of it and learn from what my students were experiencing. And so, you know, it's, it's an equally valid result of that process to have students not paying attention at all to the reading items and only watching the videos and really engaging with them effectively. And if that's the case, you know, that's, that's valuable information. And that is clearly a learning community responding to that particular environment. But I think, you know, if, if I could boil it down, because I rambled there a little bit, I do think that for me, it was a choice about making my content more responsive and reactive and more kind of richly interconnected in the existing, you know, sort of conversation about popular culture in this, in this course's case. And so it's, it became the right fit solution for that content. And in responsive and reactive, you mean responsive is revising content and pushing it without having to redo an entire video and reactive in the, the documents you produce allows you to explore them through hyperlinks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a great, that's a great way to define both of those terms. I think it works, it works in that multi-directional way where it was a way for me to more efficiently and effectively produce content that I saw was meaningful for students. And it allowed students more flexibility and more opportunities for kind of direction and exploration as they engage the content. Hi, I want to ask uh, a different question. My name is Leland. Hi, thanks, Chris. I enjoyed your talk a lot. Um, I might be thinking on a very different wavelength. Um, I was planning to use video after every class for maybe a five minute production just to say okay here are some things that came out of our discussion and here's here's a way to apply those in your um in your reading for next class where it sounds like you're talking about something pretty high tech and um you know maybe a half an hour uh video or a 45 minute video or something that's very lengthy and 
Um, and therefore, I now, if that's what you're thinking, I can understand why you're saying, oh, and there's some real drawbacks there, because it's kind of bulky and, um, and not responsive. But my, again, my take was just, I'm going to use video as a way of uh, contacting or, or uh, reinforcing my contact with the students right after class. Well, and Leland, I think that's a great point. And what you're describing is exactly the kind of framing of the utility of video that, I, that I'm after here, right? Like you, you've made the determination that in that context, it's you calling information from the class session, from the students, contextualizing it, framing it, and prompting future thought, and encoding that in a brief video of yourself communicating with your students is exactly, you know, the, the kind of use case for really highly efficacious video. I mean, I think that's, that's great. And that work of encouraging modeling reflection and metacognition and then encouraging students to do the same could be effective in a variety of different delivery methods, but it seems like a nice use case for video and a relatively low cost way to produce it, right? I mean, you could just record yourself on your phone saying that reflection and pushing it out. Right, well, that's, you know, listening to what you were saying before, I was thinking, gee, I was just gonna, you know, talk to the Zoom camera there and <laughs> post that up on Canvas. Is that okay? Yeah. I guess you're saying, yeah. that's fine if that's what, that, that works. Well, and like I said, there's no, there's no rule, right? There's no, there's no rules here. So my advocacy is not for or against video, it's for, mindful and thoughtful teaching practices. And what you've described is precisely that. Great. Though, I'm a person who's made a fair amount of videos. And um, what starts out as, you know, hey, I'm just gonna quickly, oh, that didn't come out. Oh, what's going on here with the hair? And then, oh, and then, and then all of a sudden, but wait a minute, my point isn't well made. I need to rewrite this. And then I need to do a script. And then all of a sudden I need a teleprompter. Um, what I, the, the challenge of video is always that it seems very easy. I'll just hit record. And in fact, it becomes a whole production. Um, and I mean, again, I've done this quite a while now. And um, boy, every one of them is a friggin' ortho, you know, dental work and a root canal. I think too, in Chris's, as I'm thinking about what Chris is saying, there's a radical provocation here because the comfortable thing about video is that it takes up the same amount of time as a class. So I know that I'm teaching a class because I have two 25 minute videos and that adds up to 50 minutes and that's a class. And I know that's a class because when I went to graduate school, they were 50 dang minutes long. What Chris is suggesting is a de-linking from the constraint of time and saying, you're gonna put up a document and that document has a certain amount of content. The, the amount of time the students spend on it maybe isn't the measure of the content. So that brings me to another question is, Chris, how do you leverage a document responsive and reactive, as you say, into a discussion. How do you get students to, to think through that document? Because when I video, it's my enthusiasm and energy, my idiosyncratic nature, that is what I hope is carrying the day. In a document, how do you get the students to work it? Hey. William, can I add to that too, which I think is a related question that I have is um, I'm less concerned about me not being in a room with the students as the students not being in a room together. <laughs> and so um, while I'd like the students to engage with me, even more I'd like them to engage with each other. So um, like you said, William, how do you, how do you get them to engage in a video or a document <laughs> um, with either me or, or possibly more importantly each other? Yeah, those are great, great questions. And Amy, thanks for the additional um, sort of valence of that. I think that the, the question of how to get students to engage in content and how to get students to engage with each other is certainly independent of any of the choices of content presentation we're talking about here, 
right? Um, no matter how charismatic or no matter how perfectly meticulously designed, you know, a piece of content is, um, there are still variables that will <laughs> impact how a student's going to engage with it. You know, I think for me, um, you know, I talked about thinking through the lens of metacognition and self-reflection. For me, that's a, that's a core outcome for any learning environment that I engage in, either as a learner or as a teacher, or as a, as a designer, frankly, working with other faculty, designing their, their environments. So for me, you know, I, if I'm delivering a piece of content through a, a kind of, you know, hyperlinked document with some music video clips, you know, the example that I gave, um, what I do at the end of a document like that typically is extract some kind of probing questions based on some of the concerns that emerged, but leave them open enough where they invite students to contribute back to that piece of content. Because I, 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 as we all know, the kind of question that opens up for a student, um, the need to define their own approach to answering the question can be a, an effective way to kind of get them to start thinking about the question itself in addition to the actual answer. So I'll, I'll end documents that way, but that's unenforced, right? So I'm not like, I'm not like tallying which students read those questions and which students engage in them, but they become the kind of feed into the kind of engagement architecture of my courses. In, in my particular case, I use um, Slack to facilitate engagement with students in a kind of discussion environment. Um, and so I will, I will produce kind of prompts and some kind of general questions. And again, this is for a pop culture course, so it's typically like related to whatever current events are happening, like, you know, Korean pop music fans disrupting Trump's kickoff rally, like those kinds of things are the things where a, that a pop culture course can leverage, right? Because they're happening in real time. Um, but I will craft prompts that recall the kind of concerns and questions that are being threaded through the content and then open a space for students to, to connect to those things themselves. And sometimes it requires some prompting and sometimes they get it right off the bat and, and make the connections in it and it prompts a, a tremendously stimulating discussion. But that's the kind of approach that I take, right? Which is opening up the door for thinking about the framing of the content and the questions that drive it and then trying to reinforce that same kind of framing in all the different opportunities you have to engage students and that can be you know asynchronous discussion of the type i'm describing it can be you know discussion forum work in in canvas course shells it can even be the kind of um feed that leads into a video conference you know synchronous course session right that then kind of guides the discussion that's happening there i think there are a lot of ways to do it but um opening up the space to acknowledge and recognize those patterns of connection across content and engagement and assessment and experience is kind of a, a fundamental design principle that I try to bring. More questions? So, Chris, you mentioned you use Slack. Um, would you discuss your choices for discussion and um, how, I think video provides the illusion of synchronicity because you're there talking. Um, text appears so asynchronous. Could you discuss how, how you generate discussion effectively and how that discussion leads back to some kind of self-reflection? Yeah, absolutely. And, and I'll try not to really launch in to this because this is one of my hobby horses <laughs> in teaching and what has really defined some of my own practices as, a, as an online teacher. But I will say as, as a starting point, the baseline for me is that actually asynchronous facilitates better discussion than synchronous. And that is both anecdotal and is and I've, I've lived that experience um, and found it consistent. Um, but also I think it's generally applicable in that um, we have all been in classroom environments, even when we try to facilitate discussion, where it isn't facilitated. And even in those class environments where we feel like we've had the best discussion in our teacherly careers, it's likely that 15% of your students actually said anything. In that, in that class session, right? I mean, it's always a, a lower percentage than we think, even when in the moment we're kind of amplified by the discussion. 
I think one of the most stark realizations for me in starting to teach online was what 100% parchment actually looks like, <laughs> because it does not look like a stimulating 15%, you know, participation rate in an on-campus course. It's overwhelming. I mean, it's huge, right? And I think the the value there is that what I saw almost immediately was when when discussions were brought out of a synchronous experience and into an asynchronous one, the students who need more than five seconds to formulate their thought or what they want to contribute have a door opened for them, right? Those are the students, the, the, the 85 percent of the students in your class who need more than that five seconds, that door is always closed, right? They've never been able to actually engage at the level that perhaps they want to because they don't have the time or they don't feel comfortable making their contribution in the kind of compressed and rapid environment that a synchronous discussion generally necessitates. So seeing that asynchronous element open up that door to all students engaging when and how they're able and seeing the kind of unique contributions that they were able to craft when they didn't have to play by the same rules that the overachievers who raise their hands, you know, five seconds before you've asked the question do, <laughs> Like seeing that was completely illuminating for me. Now, this is obviously applicable to a relatively small um, discussion-based course. So it's not that that realization is not going to track, you know, across every 500 person lecture, you know, that, that we have to teach. Um, but in general, I think the principle is worth reflecting on that when we, as William, you're saying, when we take time out of the equation, when we allow students to engage at a, at whatever pace, whatever speed feels comfortable to them, you know, within the, within the parameters of whatever due dates and things and requirements you have for the course, then you start to see their unique engagement with that content and the, and the diverse ways that students will engage in those pieces of content. And I think that in and of itself is a facilitator of engagement. I mean, that, I mean, I didn't really have to do anything other than just not be teaching in a classroom <laughs> to have that effect be yielded. But, but what I would do, you know, the way that I would approach trying to kind of prompt that along and, and you know, help people out a little bit is really by um, setting early in the semester an expectation of the kind of conversation that I hope we can produce, right? So modeling the kind of question asking, um, responding, replying in threads, bringing in additional posts, you know, original posts, that kind of stuff in the Slack architecture. Um, modeling that behavior and then basically systematically removing myself from the discussion progressively as the semester goes on so that I can then dramatically truncate what how I'm contributing to the conversation by prompting people back into the kind of mode that we had modeled in the first couple of weeks. So that opens up a space where students aren't expecting to respond only to me they're not expecting me to respond to all of them, but they are expecting to engage directly with each other. Um, and that kind of like displacement of my ego <laughs> and my presence as an instructor is difficult, right? I mean, it's hard for us to, to think that we might not be in all moments the value proposition of that learning experience. Um, but when we can displace ourselves and selectively displace ourselves, I should say, thoughtfully displace ourselves, we see our students open up. That was a long way of answering your question. Can I just give a plug for some practices that we, that are helpful in the kind of deconstruction that you're talking, a deconstruction of ego. Um, in my 12 person uh, discussion classes, I have students break up into groups several times in the course of the 70 minutes or um, 15 minute period. Um, and they work in groups for a minute and a half, no more than that, and then they have to come back and, and, uh, and report out. That's a little bit uh, stuffy, but um, bring their, uh, the results of their conversation to class. And I don't give them the same assignment in their groups so that they actually have to rely on each other within a group to get somewhere. The, the questions are hard, and then they need to hear from the other people as well. Um, Zoom has made it easier in one sense because now I've got, I can throw them into any old uh, groups that I want and not just with the people they're sitting next to. That's a big improvement. And, um, you know, and then they get the 
one minute warning um, and they get to kind of ease themselves out of the conversation and bring it back in. And that kind of moving in and out frequently, I think is really, has been for me facilitated by Zoom, but it's a, it's a practice I think that um, can be adopted even, even in the actual living classroom. Um, so. I think that's great. And, and I think that's a great instance of um, what one might frame as a, as a constraint of technology actually yielding pedagogical dividends, right? Like re forcing you to reframe how you might facilitate that experience when you're not using Zoom, right? It's, it's really when we open ourselves up to being receptive to those kinds of pattern changes, I think there's a lot of yield. Well, I think that was your point at the outset, right? To say, okay, um, we're used to, and, and William picked up on this as well, you know, we're used to a certain kind of classroom and we think that that's normal and we accept the limitations it imposes upon us. And um, now what do we do? Hmm, I'm gonna be teaching online exclusively in the fall. Um, do I wanna replicate what's in that classroom? Heck no, I wanna do something else. I mean, this is, <laughs> in the history of technology, you see early cars that look like carriages. In the history of pottery, you see early um, clay baskets that, you know, clay pots that have basket designs on them because people haven't recognized the liberation provided by this new technology. So I think you're encouraging us to, to shake it up and to do things that we, not, we wouldn't necessarily have done in, in person. So I think that's great. Leyland, that's a great uh, summation of, I think, Chris is really provocative and interesting discussion. I think that thinking about the 100% participation classroom in engineering is interesting. I think, you know, in a 12 person class, that seems possible, but to think about how students might guide their own way through a homework assignment and how their mutual reinforcing questions might, might work through over the course of a week long or a 10 day homework assignment is, is interesting. Um, we'll leave that for another discussion. Chris, I want to thank you for giving such an energetic and thought-provoking talk. I really appreciated it. Thank you so much. Um, I want thank to thank you for, you having me. for showing up. It's wonderful. Uh, this is a great, really thoughtful. I'll post this video today and um, onwards, folks. <laughs>